Inner Voice, a heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian. Break free from the forces holding you back. Get the life you deserve. Eliminate stress, reduce anxiety, decrease depression, and start living your full potential. Thousands have used Dr. Fujian Zane's Awareness Integration Theory, an evidence-based behavioral health breakthrough with incredible life-changing results. Getting rid of past trauma, having fulfilling relationships, increasing earnings, and living their best life. Now, the Fujian app is available to everyone. The app is Dr. Fujian Zane's Awareness Integration Theory in the palm of your hand. Download the Fujian app today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Inner Voice Podcast, a heartfelt chat with me, Dr. Fujian Zain. I'm a psychotherapist and author and the originator of the Awareness Integration Theory. It's so great to be with you today. Um, here are so a series of uh, my book, which you guys have been asking for regarding the awareness integration theory. Life Reset is a self-help book where you could go through the process and 21 different areas of your life and going through the process and looking at your thought process, your emotional process, what you've created, where is it coming from, and how can you shift it and integrate it into yourself and create a future. You look at the past, clear the past, create a future for yourself all on your own through journaling, through the book, Life Reset. For all of you who are therapists or life coaches, the Awareness Integration Therapy um, is the best book for you since you're going to go through learning exactly how to uh, go through this approach with your clients and create um, a great effective life for them. And then the third one and the latest one, Intentional Parenting, with two of my amazing co-authors, Dr. Nicole Jafari and Dr. Eileen Manukian. Both of them are experts in child development. And uh, we, we um, wrote this book for all of you who are parents, who are educators for early childhood, all the way to teenagers and young adults. And you'll see chapter by chapter of um, what the developmental stages are, what works, what doesn't work, and how to implement um, the awareness integration theory um, in your parenting skills, even for your grandparents who are constantly dealing with your grandchildren. I'm sure you love them. But there are areas that you probably are going to be part of the, raising them. So this might also support you. I'm excited today. In this episode, we talk um, with Dr. Beth Fisher Yoshida. She is a global expert and educator in intercultural negotiation and communication. She's the program director of Columbia University's Master of Science in Negotiation and Conflict Resolution, negotiation consultant for the United Nations and the CEO of the consulting agency, Fisher Yoshida International. She works in the US and worldwide, conducting workshops on leadership, cultural workplace conflict, and negotiation, and boasts of a client list that includes Fortune 100 companies, nonprofits, military security forces, governments, NGOs, and educational institutions. We're gonna be talking about her new book, New Story, New Power. A Woman's Guide to Negotiation. She helps women of all ages make successful negotiations a reality. Now, this isn't only for women. All you men are going to learn a lot also. And um, we talked a lot about the different angles of negotiation, uh, what you need to come in, what stories you need to come in, whether it's for having your own business or it's being in a corporate world or being in your marriages and your family. I really thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and I'm positive you can. And you can find her at BethFisherYoshida.com. Subscribe to this podcast, my YouTube channel, and connect with me through all of my website, FujanZane.com, or any of my social media. I'd love to hear from you, to know what um, feels good to you, what you want to learn, um, what are some of the topics you want um for me to talk to uh, with my amazing guests and all. All right, so here it is. Without further ado, Dr. Beth Fisher Yoshida.
Dr. Beth Fisher Yoshida, it is so hello. nice to have you at our podcast and um, hello to you. Oh, hello to you. Thank you so much for inviting me on. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Absolutely. I love your book, um, New Story, New Power, A Woman's Guide to Negotiation. First of all, why did you feel and think that you needed to write a book about women's guide to negotiation? Okay. So basically, of course, everything that I have in the book, anybody can use any gender. However, the reason I targeted it to women is because over the years, I've been working with a lot of different groups and really started to specialize working with women, some very high powered women, some people who have been very successful in their careers, or women who were junior just starting out and everybody in between. So I've done it with in workshops, in coaching sessions, in teaching classes at the university. And I started to notice certain patterns about where women felt challenged by negotiation and where they didn't, and where they were successful, where they were not. And then I also compared that to some of the research that was done and uh, the contradictory messages that were coming out from all over. So since I work a lot in the area of story and narrative and the stories we carry, I wanted to understand what were the stories that women were carrying about who they are as negotiators that affected how they negotiated at the table. Sometimes it worked well for them and sometimes not. So I figured, you know what? I have so many stories to tell about so many women that I thought, let me put it together because I know that there are practical tips that we can share. And it's a very practically oriented book on purpose. So anybody can pick it up at any chapter and find something that they can use the next minute in the next negotiation, because we do negotiate all the time. So that's why I put that together. And hopefully it respects the women that I've worked with over the years and supports women in general going forward with their negotiations. And if men want to read it and learn more about how women can negotiate, that would be fine too. <laughs> Definitely, there are a lot of amazing tools um, that are both for all, all genders. And I, uh, but I do think that it's important. Uh, and thank you for uh, taking it from the slant of a woman. Um, there's been a lot of not only for personal experiences, but I also work with a lot of high power women. And one of the things that I've keep noticing is the conversation about why is a woman's power so threatening? So a man's power is doesn't appear to be um, threatening in a way, I'm, and I'm talking in corporations necessarily, or even in marriages, because we're talking negotiation, like you're talking about marriage and it's negotiation every day. You're talking about family system, it's negotiation every day. You talk about work in corporate world and trying to get yourself up in businesses or you know, whether you have your own business, small business, or you're part of a bigger corporation, you're negotiating all day. So when I'm talking about the power, it's almost like it's given, it's expected, um, and somehow it, it's even protective when we see it from a male perspective, uh, even when women see it from men's per per perspective. Um, and obviously we are distinguish it from abuse. We're not talking right now about, when I talk about power, I'm not talking about abuse. I'm talking about like healthy power. But even when we're looking at healthy power, Beth, somehow women's power becomes threatening to men and even to other women. Um, what have you found in all of the research uh, when we're looking at negotiation in how to either balance or um smooth this power because again um my experience is that a lot of times women had to utilize their anger either to do to, to become more powerful or at least their voice to be heard or they had to uh with some countries where that kind of an anger was not taken utilize other passive ways or active ways of utilizing their uh, their body, their sexuality, their sensuality, their beauty, uh, their nurturance, their motherhood. It brings so many other things to it to almost like soften it up and then yet have it powerful. That was a lot I said. I hope, but <laughs> please unpack it. 
<laughs> no, it's, it's great. So, you know, I think the concept of power, not even the practice of it, right? Just the concept of it is that we tend to think about any dominant group. So if men have traditionally for many, many years in many places around the world been the dominant power, then if you, or other women have like the token woman in a situation. And so women protect that as well. If you think about it from a scarcity model, it really means that if I give you any power, I'm giving up something for myself. So it's, you know, we talk about like a fixed pie in negotiation terminology. So if you have one pie and if I'm giving you a slice or the bigger the slice, then the less I have. And I say, let's reframe that in a couple of ways. So number one, let's think about multiple ways of having dessert. So now you're going to a higher meta level of perspective, not just on the ground with that one pie. The other thing is typically when we think about power and people wanting to hold on to power because they're afraid, they're threatened about letting anything go, they think about power over and that's a matter of controlling. What I like to think about is power with. So for example, if you think about you're on a team in an organization, now you may have an individually performance appraisal, but you still are on a team. I want all of my team members to look as good as they are and to be as good as they are, because that just lifts me up as well. So it's a very different shift. I'm not going to hoard the power, because then with power really does come responsibility. That means I have to be responsible for everything, and that's not what I want either. So the whole idea about power with, which they say women are geared towards, being communal, being collective, being relationship oriented. So I say, let's use that. But let's not talk about using that because then some research has shown that women are disadvantaged if they talk about what their natural attributes are and then they use them. So I say, well, don't talk about it, just use it. Because to me, negotiation is relational anyway. It's about building a relationship and then power with. Just one more thing on that, I use the frame, how can I make you look like a hero? I may or may not say it out loud, but in my actions and my mindset, when I'm interacting with somebody, I want to know, how can I make this person look like a hero? Because if this person is a hero, it benefits me as well. Because there's plenty out there. I don't have a scarcity model. There's plenty out there for everybody for whatever we need. That's my two cents on that, about power. Beautiful. Yes, um, my I had a very interesting experience where... Um, as a, in a collaborative way of you know of everybody being together, as I came in to um, look at handling um, a paper, a scientific paper, and um, came in to collaborate and bring everybody together and create all of that, it started ruffling a lot of feathers. And one of the things that was interesting was the message it, it came around why you know of 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 a woman has to do this. And, and I kept checking, like, what is the problem? What is the problem? And I finally heard from one of the people that, yes, there's more of, there's no respect to, um, to women in, in that realm. And therefore, um, it's like, why should a woman's name be on top of this? It should be uh, the men's name to be on top of it. And it was interesting that it took another man to stand up to all the other men, to stand up for the role of the woman to, uh, and, and the value that was there. Um, and this was not even in a, in a Middle Eastern country, because a lot of times I, my background, you know, I come from Iran, and my background with a lot of other cultures, Middle Eastern cultures, where the culture is a little bit more of a patriarchal system where automatically the power goes to them. Um, you, could, you could see that that um, there is no room on a normal level on top for women anyway. So if you were going to negotiate your way up there, it took a lot more than just utilizing your skills to be there. And, but I was interested, it was interesting to me that I also saw that in the Western culture, which uh, supposedly there is a conversation that that no longer is necessary or it's it's applicable. Um, and it was very shocking to me. What has your research and um, and experience have been in negotiating 
in um, negotiating in a place where as if the context is supposed to be that you have no room for that. Yeah, so there's a lot to negotiate every single day. So I think a couple of things. One is, you know, you really need to decide which negotiation you're going to engage in because you can't negotiate everything. You spend your whole life just negotiating and then never really doing the work, whatever it is you want to do. So I think part of it is, what do you really want to get from it? If you need to build up your reputation and your prestige, and it's really important for you to be the top or second author on a paper, then that's something you need to negotiate up front and you need to figure out what is my contribution. So if you will be able to get that, you may have to work much harder to get there. But if the goal is to build up your reputation and your prestige, then that's what you need to do to get there. If that particular paper is you know, not as important, it's just one more paper and I just want to continue to build my collegiality with other people, then being third, fourth, fifth name is not as critical. So you have to decide what is really important because whatever we do, wherever we put our energy, then we have to decide is that worth it or not. So if it's something really important to me and really according to my values, then I'm going to push to get what I want there. If it's not, then I have to think, okay, if it's not that important, am I okay not pushing? Because at the end of the day, you have to live with yourself. So I always say you need to figure out what are your values, what's really important, what are your goals, and then what can I do so I don't compromise myself? Like I can compromise on issues, but I don't want to walk away feeling upset with myself because I compromise. So I need to pick and choose. You know, every day there's going to be something else. And you just have to think in terms of a career trajectory, what am I willing to do or not do? When I did a one study, I worked with women in STEM, so in the sciences and so on, similar to your background. And I asked them, you know, I had uh, interviewed women who were junior in their career under five years or maybe 10 to 15 years mid-career or more than 25 years senior in their career. And I wanted to know what was it like for them, experience, you know, their negotiation experiences, what strategies and tactics that they use. And one of the things that really impressed me was the women who were in those STEM professions for more than 25 years. Now, they had to be successful on some measure because they were in there for 25. They really figured out how to play the game, how to position themselves. And it wasn't always a bed of roses, so to speak, but they had the endurance. They had the long term goal in mind, and they just continued working towards that goal. And then they became respected in their field. They had to earn it. And maybe they had to work harder than a man or another person, but they had to earn it. And now the junior women are having to earn it, although the culture now in many places around the world, especially in the US, for example, has a very big push on getting more women involved in STEM. Organizations are being looked at to say, what are your numbers? And organizations in general are better at recruiting but not as good at retaining. So that's the area where we really need to do a lot more work in an organization. How do you have and support that junior woman in her career to move mid-career, to move up into the upper ranks of management and leadership in organizations? So one of the things I'm hearing from you, Beth, is that um, one is uh, know the game, learn the game, and whatever the game is, then you take the steps of uh, moving toward the game, negotiate your way toward the game um, of winning. Not only I'm winning, but the winning of all. So we're all gonna be there. We're all gonna be the heroes and I can find the place. And maybe as I go through those processes, then I can change the game, but I can't expect to change the game when I'm not in it or fighting it. So as I come in, learn it, move forward, that's where I can get to where I need to be and then see if there's a shift on, on changing the game. Because as you were saying is, this is the path. However, the companies have changed, which said, no, we want women actually there. So the game is actually now changing. It is, it is. So there's a sense of agency that you have to have. And in order to have agency, you have to know what you're doing <laughs> to some degree. So you have to prepare. I'm very big on preparation. You have to prepare. And some people say, oh, yeah, 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 I know this. I'm like, no, you really need to prepare a lot more because you want to be able to manage yourself in the situation, depending on whatever comes your way. And you don't always know. 
So I like to explore a couple of different scenarios of what I think might happen during the negotiation. Well, if I ask for this, I might get this in response, then what do I do? If I ask for this here and somebody else responds differently, so I pick those out. Now, a totally different scenario may pop up, but at least you have the confidence of that foundation of knowing as much as you can before you get in there. Because when you have that sense of agency, and I say, do not go to the most challenging person to begin with, start small and build your wins. You build your self-confidence and you build your self-esteem. And that gives you the energy and the strength to continue the cycle and to continue growing and then also representing others. Beautiful. New story, new power, a woman's guide to negotiation by Dr. Beth Fisher Yoshida. Um, Beth, you talked about the stories. You talked about uh, people come um, with their own narrative. And although they're getting into whether family systems or companies and businesses, um, they show up with it, with the narrative that they have. And what are some of the narratives that you have experienced and seen in the research um, that is workable? Like you could see it as healthy and it moves you forward and it's, you know, it's creating um, efficient results for you. And what are some of the narratives that you've noticed that holds you back? So one of the narratives, as I was sharing it with you, is that in certain cultures and in certain places, women have no room for that power and they actually have to shift, you know, kind of like work extra hard to get there or fight for it in a sense. Well, that's a narrative, right? So um, it's almost like coming with a, that type of the colored glasses within that set space, whether that space actually exists in this particular group I'm going or not, but if I'm going in with that narrative, obviously I'm taking some sort of a energetic, you know, word power in my head and which helps me act that way or, um, you know, produces me to already come in with some sort of a power struggle space, which changes the whole format. Um, what, what stories can you share with us that you see that is destructive and what stories um, or narratives are healthier to hold on to? Great. So first I ask people to explore where these stories come from. So you have, or, you know, society, and we have to give credit to our families and our schools and everything else in our communities, because their responsibility to us is to socialize us, to perform, as a constructively contributing member of society. So even if, as we become adults, we realize that's really not a healthy story, it's still the story that is part of the environment that we grew up in. So we have to unpack all the stories to understand where they came from. Because sometimes people get into habits, which we might call unwanted repetitive patterns. You get into a habit of behavior that's not helpful, but you just keep doing it. And it's so deeply embedded in us, right? We don't know, where did that come from? Why am I doing it this way, even though you tell yourself, no, don't go there, don't do that, don't say that, and then you you say it anyway. So first I ask people to unpack the stories that they have and to pick out what's working well for them and grow those stories, and then what's getting in the way and either like, you know, computerize, delete the story, erase the story, or modify the story so that it works for you. So for example, some of the typical stories that get in the way of women who are junior in their careers is that I'm not smart enough, I'm not experienced enough, I don't know enough, or on the other extreme, I'm going to get what I want because I am who I am and take me or leave me, and they don't necessarily have the tact or the finesse in how to work in a system. So you have these extreme stories that are both not helpful because they're not going to be received well by other people, and they're going to continue to hit, hit a wall, hit a wall, hit a wall, unless they modify that story. So they need to recognize that. Women in their mid careers have probably the biggest challenge, but that's where you can make the most change and have the most opportunity because they have a responsibility to people coming up who are sort of like, you know, nipping at their heels, ready to try to take their role as well. And they still have some kind of ceiling and they still have to manage up in the work that they're doing. So they're kind of like sandwiched, but they're that pivotal point in their career too, where they do have experience, they need more, they can mentor others and also support others. So they have a really unique position but then again, they have to think about where am I going to focus my energy going forward? 
I'm midway in my career. Have I achieved what I want to achieve by this time or not? What else do I need to do? How do I change direction or how do I keep building on what I'm doing? So you have to figure out what are those strains of stories that are helpful? Because we also know from the neurosciences that the patterns that we have in our thinking and our behaving come from way back and the stronger the story, the stronger the groove in our brain and then the more challenging it is to change it if we need to. So really identifying what those are and words matter. So that's why how we negotiate and what people say really does make a difference because it does affect us, even if it's subconscious and we don't realize we're still carrying that with us. So I always ask people, you know, when I do workshops or coaching, I have people go through a series of exercises to examine where the stories come from and start to pick out which are the ones that are helpful and why. And how do we grow those and pick out the ones that are not and we just start to modify it so in the book's title new story new power the power is in the new story and the power is in the narrative that you create or modify in a way that helps you in what you're doing and then that builds your self-esteem and then you move on to continue building in that positive way does the story need to negotiate or adapt itself to what you said at the beginning, which is there's a game there and I got to see what the game is and learn from it. Would the story adapt to it or is it that you have a, a story line that you have and then you come in to it regardless? So what I mean for, for the audience who are listening is like I could say that I'm powerful, I'm capable, I already know these things and you know, my story is that I need to come in and um, be in that position, right? I was talking to a wonderful client who um, she told me um, I'm powerful and I'm going to walk in and within six months to have the, the directorship of, of this company that I'm going there. And um, so based on that, um, what she did was she started working as she walked in she started, you know, kind of like acting like a director anyway, um, so she could show to her uh, uh, executives that I already know how to do this. However, after six months, uh, they brought somebody from outside who on paper looked amazing. And um, so she was very upset because she came in with a narrative that this is what I'm going to do and this is how it's going to happen and then walked in. But the game was different and she got very, very upset when the game was different. Um, so do we change this our story or adapt it to what's going on um, as we look at a company or a structure that we're moving into um, or, or that we need to have a contextual story from the beginning that kind of moves in and, you know, flows in with us? Yeah, I think both of those could work the different scenarios you described it depends on the situation and the person right so i think of like working the system from within or just a revolution and coming in and trying to change things if you have it in your mind where you know you are a trailblazer and you want to challenge the status quo and you want to confront what is you have to have it in you to be able to do that right because you are going to get a lot of pushback and it's not going to be a pleasant experience but if that's important to you and that's who you are because maybe you've been in situations you say no more i'm not taking any more of this so you want to put yourself in healthier constructs you don't want to put yourself in that same situation that's not going to give you what you want so that's also goes back to self-awareness and knowing yourself or you can figure out and work it from within and that means you're modifying your narrative from within and then when you were describing where she was sort of showed up and acted as a director running i thought it was like visualize it and it will become what it is you know so she may have thought, and I don't know the situation, she may have thought she was acting like a director, but they may not have seen that. See, so even though she thought she was doing all of those wonderful behaviors that a good director does, if they didn't frame it that way and recognize it, you know, it's, and I don't know how, um, how apparent she made it to them, because sometimes what women fall victim to is, I'm just going to put my head down, I'm going to do my work, and they're going to notice how good I am, and they're going to give me the recognition I need. And some people say, like, no way are they going to do that. You need to make it clear. You need to make it obvious. So was she making it clear obvious? I don't know, because sometimes we have to be super explicit. I remember back in the day, like earlier on, I would 
meet with potential clients. I would talk about because they would invite me in and I'd talk about different things and then we'd say goodbye and I didn't get the business. And my husband said to me, well, why didn't you ask for it? And I'm like, well, why else am I there? You know, why else am I there talking? They should know. But people sometimes need that very explicit statement or message for them to get it. So if she didn't say, hey, look at me, I'm acting as a director or something to that effect, of course, in a constructive way, they may not have noted. They may think that's just how she is and not necessarily equating it with director. So we have to continue, like, but then again, it goes back to that energy. Where do you want to put your energy? Some women choose to be in certain kinds of organizations over others. I lived in Japan for many years. And what I noticed is that in the super large companies, the big conglomerates, women did not do as well there, but the smaller and mid-sized company, they were much more powerful in leadership positions as well, and also really strong as entrepreneurs. So does that mean they shouldn't challenge the big corporations? No, some women may want to, but if you're looking for a success and an easier existence every day, then that's the place where you should be. So it doesn't mean there's one fit for all, but it's like everybody can find a space for themselves, depending on what they want to accomplish at the end of the day. One of the things you just said, which I think is important, and I, um, it's also a chapter in your book, is that you can have, you know, we've talked about the context inside. We've talked about the storyline that you come. We've talked about, um, you know, what the game is out there and how you could look at it, learn it, uh, see what you need to do. And what you just said also is there are not only one game out there in the world. There are many, many games. And if one does not appear to be suitable to uh, to um, hard to get there. There's always another game that is suited for you and you could, you know, succeed, succeed a little bit more effortlessly in it. Um, and then you brought the conversation into there is a communication skill for negotiation skills. <laughs> so can we talk a little bit about what are some of the effective communication that creates um, an efficient negotiation? Yeah, one of my favorite questions is I ask myself, what's really going on here? Because sometimes the presenting issues, it's like, really, they're getting really very emotional, and very attached. And that seems very minor to me. I need to explore further because maybe this really is super important to this person, or maybe that's just a presenting issue and there's something else going on underneath. So you really, really, I mean, people talk a lot when they talk about communication, really good listening skills, but you really do need good listening skills. And when I say listening, it's like on multiple levels, you need to really be attuned to the actual substance of what somebody's saying, but then at that feeling, empathy level, like what's going on here, what's being said or not said. And I also wanna know what's not being verbalized because there's other stuff going on. What are the nonverbal, the tone, the facial expressions, the body gestures and so on to get the full picture. And then I wanna ask good questions. You know, a really good question can just shift the whole dynamic in a negotiation. And then paired with that, I ask people to always be prepared with one or two questions that they just have in their pocket in case they need it. And that would mean that in a moment when they may get thrown off and they lose their center or they really don't understand, you ask an opening question to pull that information, which gives you time to regroup yourself and recenter while you're getting information. Information is power. And so you have to build trust in the relationship so that people feel comfortable opening up. And then if people open up too quickly, you think, okay, why do they want me to know that? What's going on here? So I'm always asking questions to myself on multiple levels, but really being attuned to what's happening there. Not what I'm gonna say next, not what I'm gonna to do tomorrow, but just being super present because there's so much information that happens. Even over Zoom, there's so much information that happens between people and that's about the communication. So really good listening and really good questions that open up for you to get information. New story, new power, a woman's guide to negotiation by Dr. Beth Fisher Yoshida. Um, Beth, let's change the whole dynamic of our conversation and go from companies to relationships because every single day we are, um, we're negotiating in our marriages and our family system. There's no way that you could get off one day without it, right? There's two people who come in under the same roof um, and they are collaborating on space, uh, temperature. <laughs> I mean, yeah. simple things, 
things we don't even think about. And it's like simple thing of, you know, somebody getting freezing and it's like, I'm hot. Um, and then, you know, food, um, children, finances, um, socialization, friends, in-laws. And you see every single day you're dealing and you have to negotiate because two people, uh, whether they're from the same gender or different genders together, different family setups, even some different cultures come in together and they're systematically negotiating all that. Uh, with a lot of uh, background narrative, right? The, the people come into their, uh, to their marriages and family systems from a completely already set cultural narrative, right? Like marriage should be this way. And half of the time, they're not even negotiating. Like you said, they're not even talking or asking for things because they think it should be, you know, as simple as it was just Valentine's, Valentine's, they should know already what to bring for me. Like there's, you know, I don't even need to negotiate or converse because they should know already. They should know how they should love me. They should know everything already. Um, and you have an amazing uh, whole, you know, chapters around marriage and family and how to negotiate there. It's a different context. Yeah, definitely a different context. And because of that, there's much more emotion involved because when we go to the workplace, we have our definition of being professional. And that means we probably don't show a lot of emotions, even though we have them and we get hurt and we get recognized, all those things, but we don't show it there. But at home, it's a little bit different. We're a little freer. And this is, of course, generalizations. Not everybody is. But in general, at home, we're freer and more emotional. And more emotion plays into it. Plus, you mentioned the narrative. We come into a marriage saying, this is what a good wife does. This is what a good husband does. This is what a child does, and so on. But we may not share that narrative with the other person. We probably don't even articulate it. It's just something that we have with us that we carry. And so you want to be recognized and people say, well, I'm not a mind reader. I don't know if you don't say it. And even if you say it literally, somebody may not get it. You know, if somebody says, I like flowers, they may or may not like the flowers. What they like is the symbol that the flowers show appreciation and you were thinking of me. The other person may hear only flowers. And so whenever it's a, a, only flowers, but you said you like flowers. Yeah, but I didn't only want flowers. I wanted something else. I wanted the recognition. And then there's this miscommunication there. So we have these preconceived notions about what it means to be in a family, what it means to be in a relationship, what it means to be a married couple or not. You know, some people say we want to live together. We don't want to get married because the story they have about the piece of paper that makes it legal and how they feel about all that. The whole idea about commitment, you know, and how are we in this forever or not? Well, I thought we were, but no, we're not, whatever it is. So all of those need to be negotiated and People have different, what they say, like love languages, right? So people want to be shown affection or appreciation in different ways. And that means that's the way they show it to others, which may not work. So some people may want the words, the affirmation, the appreciation. Some people say, just if you vacuum the house or cook me a meal, that's enough for me. I get it. I like a present maybe. So you, I want you to buy me a present. So all of those messages get very convoluted sometimes because even if we actually articulate it, it may not be heard the way we want. So it's a constant effort and an iteration about how you get in there and managing the emotions. So you're not just necessarily putting guilt or shame or the other person, but getting them to feel what you want them to feel about how you are in that moment. One of the things that I've really found is, uh, which it circles back exactly to what you said in the beginning, um, which is how do I make you look good and feel good and how in, in marriages, how can I create an us, uh, the we that looks, looks amazing and feels amazing to both of us. So it's not like I'm going to get my way. It's how are we, how can we, how can my way be in a context of our way? And that really, really supports, um, the path of negotiation when you look at the end result where it's um, inclusive um, in, in, in all aspects of it. So what you started sharing with us um, at the beginning of our conversation really holds in tune also with family and, and marriages, which is, um, I always say it's harder to negotiate sometimes 
at home is because when you're going to work, um, your relationships are not personal. At the end of the night, you're not, you know, putting your head close to each other uh, in the same bed and needing to also be sensual and be attractive to each other and, you know, be each other's best friends. You can, you can negotiate and have a wonderful, friendly, civilized um, relationship at work for so many hours. But when it comes to your marriage, it's it becomes a lot more encompassing. So how to negotiate and be yourself and take care of yourself while you're taking care of the us um, for, for, for two people who are in there is becomes crucial. So yeah. negotiation becomes, it, it has a different context. Yeah, there are two thoughts I had on that. One is that research has shown that when you are negotiating in very strong personal relationships, you end up doing worse because because you care about the other person. So you're always negotiating the relationship and you're negotiating the substance, right? The issue that you want. So because you care about the other person, you say, okay, fine, that's okay. You can have whatever. So you give in a little bit more. The other thing is, if you think about it on a continuum with two extreme ends, somebody who overtells what they need and doesn't really pay attention to what the other party needs, and somebody who doesn't say anything but just gives and gives and gives, right, and they accommodate, neither one is satisfactory because it's not mutual and it's not mutually beneficial. So one person is like a doormat, constantly being stepped on and giving, and then one day just maybe blows up or just walks out or says, you never... You never ask about me. You never, never, never. And like, well, I, I didn't know. I thought that everything was fine because you didn't ask me to ask about you, right? So, well, I shouldn't have to ask you. You should know, right? All that. Or the overtelling and never acknowledges the other side or very rarely acknowledges the other side. It's always about what I need, what I need, what I need. And that's okay once in a while, but it's not okay to stay there. Because if we move back and forth on the continuum, we need to assert and ask for what we want in a way that makes sense and is polite. And then we need to also hear what the other person wants or intuit. The person may not say it, but you know the person well enough to say, I think there's something a little off today. Let me figure out what's going on. What can I do? Because if you want the person to look like a hero, you want the whole relationship to be that way, then it has to be attuned to what's going on and then to know where on that continuum you need to be. And then you need to have the skills to do it. Right? So that's a whole other level about the agency, but agency with skills is what makes a better combination. Uh, Beth, you also talk about post-negotiation. Yes. So hear about uh, post-negotiation. So I divide the negotiation into phases. So you have your whole preparation phase and each phase is important. Preparation, figuring out who I am in this negotiation, what's important to me, what do I know about the other party? What do I know about the context? What do I know about the issues being negotiated? All of that. And, the, and that helps you during the negotiation. How do I manage my emotions? How am I staying present? How am I using the information, which is probably flying at me really quickly? How do I make sure I stay central? And how do I make sure I move it in a direction I want it to go? And then post-negotiation, sometimes people drop the ball here. It's so important. So much information was exchanged during the process you want to make sure we're on the same page. We walked away with the same shared understanding of what we agreed to and what the follow up steps are. And so I always recommend having some kind of a chart which lists who's doing what by when and what resources are needed and so on. You, know, you make the chart according to what works for you and also summarizing. This is what I took away from the negotiation. This is what I heard our commitments are and just making sure that we're on the same page because if we don't I'm thinking this, you're thinking that, and it doesn't meet and it doesn't work. So every phase has its attributes. And sometimes in the post-negotiation, you may need to go back and renegotiate certain things. Not in a bad way, but just that certain things become more detail-oriented. You need to go back and hash some things out. Or maybe new opportunities arise. You go back and you just keep developing the relationship more. So every phase has its aspects, and they're all important. Is there anything we haven't shared that you really want people to know? Everybody can improve whatever they're doing right now in terms of their negotiation. There's always a way to improve as long as you have a combination of the motivation and the skills and then the practice. That's what I want to add. New story, new power, 
A Woman's Guide to Negotiation by Dr. Beth Bashir Yoshida. Uh, where can they find you and your book? They can find me uh, I'm at Columbia University. I also have a website, which is BethFisherYoshida.com. My book is sold in bookstores and on Amazon for sure. Beautiful. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Thank you, Vijana. It was wonderful speaking with you. I appreciate it. And for all of you who are out there, create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. And until next week, bye-bye. Eliminate stress, reduce anxiety, and decrease depression. Dr. Fujian Zane's awareness integration theory has helped thousands like you get incredible life-changing results. The Fujian app gives you her evidence-based treatment in the palm of your hand. Download today.